My name is Mark McGuinness, and this is the 21st Century Creative, the podcast that helps you thrive as a creative professional amid the demands, the distractions, and the opportunities of the 21st century. Welcome to episode seven of the creative disruption season of the 21st Century Creative, where we are hearing stories from creatives around the world who came up with a creative response to the challenges of the pandemic. Today, we're focused on a creative sector that is very close to my heart, which was massively disrupted, but didn't get quite the same level of coverage that others did. And that is the field of personal development and learning. And I am delighted to welcome a guest, Laura Davis, who is something of a legend in the field of therapy and healing. Her first book, The Courage to Heal, which she co-authored with the poet Ellen Bass, came out in the 80s, and it was the first book to give survivors of sexual abuse a pathway to the healing process. Laura's latest book is The Burning Light of Two Stars, a really powerful memoir about her relationship with her mother, how that relationship was disrupted by Laura's writings, and how they took steps to make peace with one another. Laura's books have been translated into 11 languages and have sold millions of copies. She's also a very experienced teacher who has been helping other writers find their voice and tell their stories at classes and retreats for many years. And when the pandemic struck in 2020, she had to cancel all her retreats for the year, leaving her with the question, what next? Now, The obvious answer, of course, was virtual teaching. But Laura had always resisted this idea. She thought it was fine for teaching information or skills-based learning, but for the kind of deep personal transformation that she facilitates, she'd always said it just wouldn't be the same. In this interview, you'll hear how Laura challenged her own beliefs and stepped out of her comfort zone to take her work online. So, if you do any kind of teaching or coaching or facilitation, this interview is essential listening. If you work on your own, in your office or studio, or in your bedroom or at, or at your kitchen table, it can feel like no one is watching. So it doesn't matter whether or not you show up. If you skip today on your novel, who would know? If you didn't go to the studio today, who would know? It's not like anyone is watching, is it? The same goes for how you show up. If you were out partying last night, you're probably not going to be at your best this morning. Even if you're well behaved on weeknights, what kind of presence are you bringing to your work each day? What did you put into your mind before you got down to work? Were you doom scrolling endless bad news? Were you sharing outrage on social media? Were you emailing back and forth about things that could really wait till later? And what kind of feelings did all of that stir up? And how will those feelings affect the quality of attention you bring to your work? But again, no one is watching, are they? Actually, they are. Because... Whatever you put on the page or the screen or the canvas or into a microphone today is precisely what your reader or viewer or listener will pick up the moment they encounter your work. 
it's as though space and time have collapsed and they are right there with you as you write, as you paint, as you compose or speak or sing. Right this moment. Deep down, you know this from your own encounters with the artworks you love. That poem that speaks to you as if the poet were in the room. That novel that is always fresh, always vivid, always humming with life each time you open it. That painting that takes your breath away each time you stand before it. That music that you feel in your heart, in your bones. Whenever you stop and really listen to it, each time you encounter a work like this, you are in the presence of a great performance. Because the power of a work of art is a result of the presence and intention of its creator while they were working on it. If they had phoned it in, you would never have heard of them. You'd be reading someone else's book or looking at someone else's art. Because a true work of art is a result of the artist's fullest attention, their deepest intention, their greatest performance. In other words, all arts are performing arts. So we need to prepare like performers. I'm lucky enough to have coached quite a few top stage performers including actors, singers, musicians, DJs, comedians and public speakers. I've learned about their pre-performance rituals, which actually extend, very often, to the whole day of a performance. They are very particular about how they spend that day. They have rules and routines covering their diet, their exercise, meditation or other mental preparation, rehearsal or warm-up time. Quite a few of them have an interest or a discipline that helps them use their time well rather than getting into trouble. Yoga, reading, learning a language or playing a game. Having a healthy distraction like this also stops them overthinking their performance. And they all have horror stories to tell about mistakes that led to bad performances, going out the night before, or getting into an argument in the afternoon, or receiving bad news just before walking out on stage. So they do everything they can to minimise disturbance and unhealthy distractions. Anything that could detract from their presence on stage. Because they know the audience is unforgiving. The audience notices every wobble, every hesitation, every fluffed line, every wrong note. And they know the audience deserves their best. It's a tough regime. But in a way, stage performers are lucky. Because they are eyeball to eyeball with their public, they are under no illusions that they are being watched and judged. And when the lights go on, there is absolutely no excuse. So they have to show up. When you're sitting there on your own, it's easy to have illusions. It's easy to pretend that no one is watching. It's easy to tell yourself, it doesn't matter if you skip today. Or if you just check your email or just take a look at Facebook before you start. Or if you just do your two hours or your thousand words or whatever goal you've set yourself, but without really showing up, without putting your heart and soul into it, without risking anything. But all of these illusions melt away when you realise that your art is a performing art, just as much as Ian McKellen's or Lady Gaga's. When you realise that if you want someone to look at your art or read your book or listen to your music, then you need to show up as if they were in the room with you, watching or reading or listening over your shoulder. When you realise that, then you start to prepare like a performer. You think about your pre-performance ritual. You think about the day and the night before your performance. You put in routines and habits that will prepare you physically, mentally, emotionally to show up like a top performer. 
Maybe you join the gym or you take up Tai Chi. Maybe you meditate or listen to something motivational or calming. Maybe you start learning Spanish or juggling so that you have a way of filling your downtime without getting into trouble. Before you start work, you avoid anything. News, social media, email, paying bills, meetings that could break your single-minded focus on your work. If all of this sounds like too much discipline, too much self-denial on top of the work itself, then you haven't quite grasped the full implications of what I'm saying. Because if you've ever performed on a stage yourself, you'll know that yes, it's scary, and yes, it takes a lot of preparation, but it can also be utterly thrilling. When you're on stage and you're in the zone, when you feel the connection with the audience and you're channeling your work, it's pure joy. And that joy, that excitement, that thrill can be there for you every day you show up for work, even if it's just you in the studio or at your desk or perched on the end of the bed. As long as you treat your art like a performing art. If you enjoy the 21st century creative, then you might like to know I offer an alternative take on creativity on my other podcast, A Mouthful of Air, where I talk about poems and what they reveal about the creative process. So here's a clip from an episode where I talk about how I got the idea for my poem, The Illusionist. The poetic form I use is a pantoum, and I got the idea for the poem while I was in the theatre, watching a magic show being recorded for TV. So there I was in the theatre, experiencing this two steps forward, one step back motion, and realising I was basically inside a pantoum. It was quite an odd feeling, actually knowing that I was inside a poem as it was happening in real life. It was like I was in the poem's engine room and I could look up and see all the gears and levers and pistons moving around me. And of course, at that point, I knew I had to try and write the poem down. You can find A Mouthful of Air on all the usual podcast platforms with a new episode every two weeks to give you a regular connection to the muse. A lot of media stories during the pandemic have focused on creative industries such as theatre and music, film and TV production. And rightly so, given the devastating impact of social restrictions on anything involving in-person performance. And we've already covered these fields in this creative disruption season. But one creative field that didn't attract so much attention, but which I'm very familiar with myself, is the field of personal development and learning. And many, many people and businesses in this sector have faced huge challenges over the last couple of years because they were unable to provide live workshops, retreats, coaching and training sessions, conferences and other in-person events. Having been a coach for 25 years and also a psychotherapist for most of that time, I know there's a special quality to an in-person coaching session or workshop or retreat that helps to foster deep connections between the people involved. 
especially when dealing with sensitive issues. I've also been coaching virtually for many years, and I've got used to working this way. But I've always respected the position of colleagues who insisted on working in person. And then along came the pandemic, and many people in the field were forced to rethink their assumptions about what was possible for themselves and for the people they help. So, when I was planning the creative disruption season, I knew I wanted to feature someone who was doing deep work in person and who had been forced to change the way they worked because of the pandemic. Now, one way I found my guests for this season was to send an email invitation to the 21st Century Creative mailing list. And it felt like an answer to a prayer when I received a reply from Laura Davis. It turned out she had originally been directed towards me by David Colin Carr, who has taught alongside Laura on many occasions. David is one of the unsung heroes of the 21st century creative. He edits my books for creatives, and he's been a source of valuable feedback on my writing for many years. So it felt like the universe was nudging me to talk to Laura. Laura is the author of The Burning Light of Two Stars, a riveting memoir about her tumultuous yet loving relationship with her mother and six other non-fiction books which have been translated into 11 languages and sold 1.8 million copies. Her first book, The Courage to Heal, co-authored with the poet Ellen Bass, was published in 1988. This was the first book to give survivors of sexual abuse a roadmap to the healing process. As Laura said to me in the interview, I was 31 years old and suddenly the courage to heal catapulted me into this weird kind of fame for the worst thing that had ever happened to me. As well as a writer, Laura is a teacher. For more than 20 years, she has helped other writers find their voices, tell their stories, and hone their craft. Before the pandemic, she was leading writing retreats around the world, taking people to beautiful places to have profound and meaningful experiences based on writing, outdoor adventure, and exploration of local cultures. Like many teachers doing deep work, Laura always taught in person, even though she had many requests for virtual workshops, because she felt it just wouldn't be the same. And then COVID arrived, and Laura had to cancel all her retreats, and she lost the bulk of her income in a moment. And like many teachers and facilitators around the world, she was left facing the question, what next? In this interview, I ask Laura about her journey as a writer and a teacher, including how to handle fame in her early 30s. She gives a frank description of the impact of the pandemic on her teaching business, and also how she rebounded from the initial shock and started teaching online, even though she'd always resisted doing this. She shares what she discovered about the surprising benefits of the online format and which elements of this she will carry forward into her future work. Laura also talks about her new memoir, The Burning Light of Two Stars, a mother-daughter story. It's the story of her embattled relationship with her mother, the rift in their relationship after the publication of The Courage to Heal, and the dramatic and surprising collision course they ended up on at the end of her mother's life. And before I spoke to Laura, I read The Burning Light of Two Stars, and I found it really compelling reading on several levels. I said to her, you know, there are some books you read and others you experience, and this is definitely one of the latter. It's an extraordinary account of love in the face of abuse and pain and also demonstrates great artistic skill in the storytelling. If you have been affected by the issue of sexual abuse and the family fallout it can create, I'd say this is an important book 
and potentially a helpful and a healing one to read. Even if you haven't had to deal with abuse, there's lots for all of us to relate to in this book in terms of the challenges and the tensions of a parent-child relationship. You know, Laura doesn't shy away from difficult subjects, but the story's actually also very funny and entertaining in parts. It's, it's a very human and a very real book, and I read it in a single weekend. As I was about to record this, I heard from Laura that The Burning Light of Two Stars has been awarded the Book Life Prize, first place for Best Independently Published Memoir of 2021. You can find out more about The Burning Light of Two Stars, as well as Laura's other books and her teaching at lauradavis.net. So, Just before we listen to the interview, given the subject of Laura's books, sexual abuse is one of the topics she discusses. We don't talk about it a lot, but I obviously want to mention this up front in case that's a sensitive issue for you, so you can bear it in mind if you decide to listen. Laura... You've been a columnist, a talk show host, a radio news reporter, and now a best-selling author and teacher. Is there a common thread in all of these different roles? Yeah, there is. Um, On my website, I have a little um, tagline. It says, healing words that change lives. And I I really do see that as the umbrella for um, everything that I've, I've done. Um, For instance, I've spent the last 25 years as a writing teacher um, in many, many different kinds of settings. But for me, writing is really just the vehicle, and it's the means by which I build communities and connect people to themselves and to each other in the deepest ways. Um, So although I've been a writer and I just published my seventh book, I think in a broader way, I've always been a communicator and an agent of change. Um, When I was um, 23, I was first published in elementary school. Um, Mm -hmm. I started a little newspaper with my friends called the Literature Club Journal. Um, Uh I I wrote it for my high school paper. Uh, In my early 20s, I was writing feature articles for small newspapers and published my first book, The Courage to Heal, when I was 31 years old. So writing has been a thread. Um, but also, when I was 23, I, I worked as a volunteer at the local community radio station, and I, I had a women's rhythm and blues show. And I just fell mm-hmm. in love with the medium of radio and just the intimate sound of the human voice. Um, a couple of years after that, I crammed into a Volkswagen with some friends from the radio station. We drove a thousand miles to a public radio conference uh, in Colorado in the Rocky Mountains. And when we got there, there were all these representatives of these radio stations in Alaska, Alaska Public Radio, and they were all hiring. And so I applied for a job uh, as a radio news reporter. I had to um, fake my audition tape. Um, which I guess showed I had the necessary (laughs) skills to create a compelling story. Um, And they flew me to Alaska for an interview, which at 25 was like the most amazing thing that had ever happened Mm. to me. And then they hired me. And um, I I made $16,000 a year, which at the time felt like this amazing fortune. Um, I, I worked there for a couple of years. And the second year, I was able to parlay that job as a reporter into having a, a live daily talk show. And I was allowed to interview anyone I wanted. And I just discovered, I just fell in love with interviewing people. Um, and I found that I was really good at it, that I could make people dig down and talk about the most real, honest things that they often would never tell anyone. And it was really, um, it was my favorite job I've ever had in my life. Um, but I was living on an island um, in Alaska, it rained 13 feet a year, <laughs> and I was Whoa. just desperate to get back to California. And mm. when I went, I moved back to San Francisco, and I knew that I was giving up my potential for any kind of career in broadcasting because 
to make it in radio, you have to be willing to move from, you know, a smaller market to a little bigger market. And then you just keep moving every two years. And I just wasn't willing to do that. The other thing that happened that year um, when I was 27 was I began remembering having been sexually abused as a child by my mother's mm-hmm. father, my maternal grandfather. Yeah. Uh, like many survivors, I'd blocked it out. And mm-hmm. when I began to remember it, it was just absolutely devastating and threw my life into a complete tailspin. And one of the ways I coped with it was writing my way through it. And that's what led me ultimately to team up with Ellen Bass and write the book that later became The Courage to Heal. Um, It was published by Harper and Row in 1988. It was the first book to give survivors of sexual abuse a roadmap to the healing process. And Within about six months, it became this grassroots international bestseller. Um, I was 31 years old, and suddenly the publication of this book had catapulted me into this this weird kind of fame for the worst thing that had ever happened to me. Ooh. And, I mean, I'd like to pick up on that word courage in the title, because clearly it takes a lot of courage to... To face up to an experience like that, to go through the healing process for yourself. But, I mean, also, it it must have taken extraordinary courage to to then write about it and and put it out there in in public in that way. How did you find the courage to do that? I was compelled. You know, I think I have have a very strong creative drive. And I think there Mm -hmm. are As a creative person, I think there are certain subjects, certain themes, certain core experiences that are our material. And at that point in my life, that was my material. And, you know, Ellen and I always felt like we were meant to write that book. I I don't usually think Mm. that way or talk that way, but I felt like we were in the right place at the right time with the right message, and we were able to communicate it in a a very um, simple way clear, accessible, and deeply emotional way so that people reading it felt like we were writing about their lives and giving them hope. Um, For me, the hardest part was um, of publishing it was what my family, how they would react. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I had to really face my worst fear was that I would lose my family and it actually did happen. Um, So, you know, that was at the same time I was experiencing this kind of Cat, um, at the same time that I was experiencing this kind of success, I was cast out of my family. Um, and in particular, my mother and I, uh, it, it really cemented an estranged relationship that was already going sour, and it just created this terrible rift between us. So, you know, I gained the world and lost my family. And the next five years, I wrote four other books uh, about healing from sexual abuse. I was out on the lecture circuit Um, But then, you know, I came to this crossroads where I realized I really didn't want my whole life and my whole career to center around the sexual abuse I'd experienced as a child. I I didn't want to be, you know, a professional incest survivor anymore. So I walked away from it, really at the peak of my success, and I I leaped without a safety net. I didn't know what I was going to do next. And in some ways, that took more courage than writing the book and publishing it to begin with. And because, you know, these days, thankfully, the climate around sexual abuse is is much more understanding and supportive than it was in those days. Because, you know, you, you really were a pioneer, you and Ellen, in, in opening up the conversation about this, weren't you? Yes, uh, we were pioneers. And um, it was really an amazing experience. And it still is because The Courage to Heal um, has been out for 30 30- four years, and it still is selling. It still is considered a classic. It, I, we still get, you know, letters and emails and messages from survivors all the time saying they've picked up the book. And, you know, unfortunately, there are new generations of survivors who need it. You know, I think mm-hmm. at first we had the um, misguided idea that, you know, all we'd have to do is put this book out, communicate this information, and then it would stop. You know, but but obviously it hasn't. So the book has had new life with new generations, 
Um, so, so that's that's a remarkable experience is to put something out in the world um, that not only is commercially successful, but really touches people in those incredibly deep ways and creates a change in the conversation in society. And I experienced that at a very young age, and I really wasn't equipped to handle it um, the way I would be now. So it was a it was a challenging, exciting, difficult, and wonderful time in my life. Um, you know, after that, I I began teaching writing, and that's what I've done for the last twenty five years. And first, I just taught some you know weekly classes in my own town. Um, designed to help people find their voice and unpack their own life stories. Um, Later, I started doing it in retreat settings and eventually internationally. And I've never worked for a university or a college. This is all me, you Mm -hmm. know, hanging out my own shingle. I've always been, um, you know, since for the last 35 years, um, a self-promoting solo creative entrepreneur. And just going back to the point where you've had this huge success very early on in your career, in one sense, you, you must have had the world at your feet. There's all kinds of options that you would have been available to you. Why did you decide to focus on teaching writing? Well, I think, you know, when, you're, when you get notoriety for a particular topic, you know, in this case, it was, um, you know, a topic of healing from trauma, um, people want you to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, the opportunities that come your way are yeah. in that same narrow band. You know, it's like a, you know, a band that has their first album that's a huge success and everyone wants them to repeat. Exactly. And so I didn't want to repeat. Yeah. Um, and I, I d- had discovered that I'm a natural teacher. Um, I love group dynamics. Uh, I love helping other people find their voices. and it just was a niche that suited me. And, you know, I started small and I found I, w- I not only really loved doing it, I was good at it. Um, and it's, it's more than just conveying information. It's, you know, I found that I was able to create safety in a group that would enable people to access memories and feelings and experiences that they really didn't have access to any other way. And so... I just feel like it's my um, skill. It's my dharma to teach like that, uh, and I love I love building those kind of communities. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the my favorite things is when you know a former student of mine says they're still meeting with people they met in one of my workshops or classes, and they you know they've been friends for twenty years now, or they still get together to write. I love oh, really? that I'm connecting people with each wow. other. That to me is is really important, much more than the craft, is the community building. Huh. Because, you know, I think a lot of people would see writing as a solitary activity. Tell me about the relationship between that that work in solitude and the very intimate experience of of writing and indeed reading a book and community. How, How do those two relate? I think they're both really important. I mean, obviously, no one is going to write for you, and you have to be the one with the pen in your hand (laughs) or your your fingers on the keyboard, (laughs) and nobody else is going to do it for you. And that does require deep concentration and solitude. Um, But I I have found that, Mm -hmm. you know, when I'm in the company of other writers, either as as a student, as a colleague, or as a teacher, it gives me so much impetus to keep going. Um, and and when you actually write in a circle with other people, um, what they write will influence you. So, like, here's an example. I was uh, teaching a weekly class one day, and I don't remember what the prompt is that I gave, but one woman wrote a story about her son being a heroin addict. And this was a subject that had never come up mm-hmm. in class before. And the next time we wrote, three other people in the same class, this was a small class, they wrote about members of their family who were drug addicts. So it's like the, the permission of one person breaking silence about something creates the space for other people to be able to write as well. One of the reasons that I really love teaching in a group setting is that when people share their words out loud, and I really encourage people to read their work out loud for many reasons, um, when other people hear someone else's story, 
it will influence um, their own writing. Uh, yeah. That's how it is in a writing group. And mm-hmm. um, and also, you you know, as you listen to others, maybe one person has a real gift for dialogue or someone else um, really creates a vivid setting or someone else, they just have the courage to admit and write about things that you would never consider. And it just keeps expanding the possibilities of the group. Um, there's also something very powerful about being witnessed, which is very different than just letting your writing fester in a notebook. Hmm. When you speak it out loud, you understand what it is you've written in a way you don't when you only write it. We often just don't know the impact of what we've written, but if you say it out loud, whether it's in a group or even just to yourself, it is a really important step in the writing process. I agree 100%. I'm discovering this over on my poetry podcast. Not just my own poems, but a lot of classic poems that I'm reading. I've known these poems for years and years and years, but I've never read them out loud. And as soon as I read them out loud, I learn something new about them and maybe about why I chose them. Because there's something about really being embodied with the voice, isn't there? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, Last spring, I recorded... um, my memoir, The Burning Light of Two Stars, as an audiobook. And what I experienced was that reading it out loud, I learned so many things about my book that I didn't know, right. even though it had taken me 10 years to write it. I mean, I found mistakes, but more than that, I found deeper emotional resonances with some of the scenes that I didn't experience until I spoke those words out loud. I, I didn't expect that at all. Hmm. In one sense, I'm not surprised because, I mean, I've said to you, I read the book recently and it was a really powerful experience. And as I said to you, on several, several different levels, I mean, partly the structure of the book, you, you've got it beautifully structured in, in the way that you build up the narrative and you've got different layers and different perspectives and different timescales. But also I think because there's so many kind of layers of emotion and different relationships and, and time in the book. And, and you say it took you a long time to write this one, which again isn't surprising. Could you say something about the process of writing this book? Yeah, well, it almost didn't get written because I, I wanted to give up so many times. Um, my first version, I wanted to write it as a play. Um, it was a, it's a story mm-hmm. about my um, tumultuous relationship with my mother from my birth to her death, and she was an actor, so I thought that writing a play huh. you know, would be a great tribute to her, but mm. I didn't know anything about writing a play. So that version was a failure. Um, I, I, I gave it to a director friend, and she just said, Laura, this is not a play. Just write your damn memoir. <laughs> 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 then I tried to write it as an epistolary book um, because there had been this long correspondence between the two of us, yeah. and I wanted to, to do it as a series of letters. Um, that didn't work either. I had readers... Um, look at that draft, and they said they felt like they were on the outside of a private Mm -hmm. conversation. Um, And then I started writing in his narrative. And I I found that, you know, the problem was I didn't have all the skills I needed to to write it because the books I'd published before were how-to books. They were information. And I really Mm -hmm. knew that structure very well. But here I was writing a full-length story um, and I really had to learn about how to create the arc of a story, how to create tension, uh, what to leave in, um, what to take out, uh, what sequence to put things in to build momentum, um, how to, how to you know. And, and I think the other challenge was uh, when I first started writing it uh, and I was writing about my mother, you know, and, and people would, I had beta readers, you know, early readers, and they would say, wow, your mother is really difficult. Because I would always ask the question, how do you feel about the mother character? And so I knew I had a long way to go just kind of psychologically and spiritually in creating the kind of story I want, which would have no taint of, you know, revenge or anyone being a villain or a hero. And Mm -hmm. so I had to do the internal work to be able to see my mother in a much, from a much vaster perspective. And I also had to be willing to bear my own underbelly. Uh, Mm -hmm. As a friend of mine said, when she read an early version, she said, Laura, this isn't the courage to heal. It's the courage to reveal. And so I I put that up on the wall (laughs) um, by my desk. And I looked at that every day. And I I started to 
um, show my own flaws so that I became, the two of us became very, very human, um, complex characters. And I knew the book was finally finished after 10 years when people would read it and they would say, oh my God, I hated your mother on this page and loved you. And on this page, I hated you and I loved your mother. And so I'm always happy when people say they loved her, um, even though she was an incredibly difficult person. But I was able to create this full-bodied portrait of her on the page. Yeah, I, I, that was absolutely my experience. I mean, I could see that she was, by any any stretch of the imagination, it would be difficult being in a relationship with her. And at the same time, she was also... Th- there's a lot of love in the book. You talk about her strengths and her charm and her wit and her charisma. And, you know, there was a real mischievous spirit that was very attractive and charming about her. So I thought I could tell you'd done a lot of work on that, and it really came across, I felt. It was a very human book. Thank you. Thank you. I I did work really hard at that. Okay, so let's go back to, say, the second half of 2019, when you are firmly established on your track as a writing teacher and as a writer, you're exploring different subjects in your own writing. You've built this really very powerful and and valuable community. And I know that you were doing the retreat work in particular. You were doing that all face-to-face, right? Yes. I, at that point, I was still teaching um, weekly classes in my local town, um, which were Mm -hmm. all face-to-face. And then I was teaching probably, you know, maybe 10 to 12 retreats a year, And they would be, some of them were weekend long, some of them were a week, some of them were two weeks. Um, I was taking people traveling, um, but, you know, so I took people to um, Bali, Vietnam, Greece, Scotland, Peru. And and these trips would combine writing, um, sometimes yoga, because uh, my partner Karen is a yoga teacher, and Mm -hmm. always a lot of cultural exploration and adventure. So it wasn't, these weren't primarily like, writing intensive retreats, but more like a creative vacation where writing would Mm -hmm. be a way to bond the group and also give people a record of some of the experiences that they had. Um, So I was doing that. Um, I was teaching a retreat annually about writing through grief, loss, uncertainty, and change. Um, I had a workshop called How to Write About What You Can't Remember. Um, I I taught lots of different things, but all in person. Um, Mm -hmm. And when the pandemic hit, um, it was just devastating to my business. You know, I remember in February of 2020, really before the impact was starting to hit a lot of people around me, I was really one of the first because I had this big retreat coming up in June of that year. Um, Mm -hmm. I had a sold out group of writers I was taking to this beautiful villa in Tuscany. And it was my biggest event of the year. And I remember at first this kind of bargaining in my head of like, well, maybe this will pass. <laughs> you know, maybe this yeah. you know will just be a few weeks or a month, and then things will go back to normal. Um, and ultimately, you know, after uh, really a lot of soul searching and then just having to face reality, I canceled not just that retreat but all the retreats I had lined up for the rest of the year. And this was. Uh, you know, much more than half my income for the year. So financially, it was really devastating. Uh, you know, boom, just like that. And just like everyone else who's in the travel business. Mm. Um, and, the you know, even the weekly classes, they were all online as well. So I, I had to immediately pivot um, like like many, many other people. And it was a huge challenge. You know, I had, for many years, people had emailed me or written and said, you know, why don't you teach online? You know, because yeah. I had you know, fans or students or people who followed my work who wanted to study with me and didn't want to travel across the country to do it. And I always said, no, you know, like there's no way I could replicate what I do in person in a digital environment. You know, I I was certain that I had to be in the room, that I had to, you know, feel the energy in the room, that I had to be able to be physically proximate to people. I had to be able to you know, touch them or listen to them or go over to them or read their body language or their facial expressions. And I felt like the, the, especially in a retreat, that everything that would happen in the physical container was essential. You know, I I chose really beautiful, sacred places to teach. And I felt like the environment was part of the container. 
And I just couldn't imagine doing any of that online. So I just always dismissed it. But suddenly, um, I had no choice. Um, and, you know, I had never heard of Zoom, like most of us. Um, yeah. But I, I, in a Hail Mary pass, I posted on my Facebook page um, saying I was considering a move to online teaching. And I just said, you know, does anyone have any tips for me? And right. I ended up hearing back from a woman I didn't know, and she was someone, one of these many people who had benefited from the Courage to Heal back in the day. Um, mm -hmm. She was an online tech host, and she offered to help me for free. And, wow. you know, a couple days later, we she sent me a link. I got online with her. She taught me how to be on Zoom. And within a week, I had moved my weekly classes online. And, you know, I remember having to, um, you know, instruct everyone. It was so foreign to everyone how to, how to get on Zoom and how to do this online thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, really those, those initial students and I learned how to do it together. And I was, you know, I was so pleasantly surprised that we could maintain our intimacy and cohesiveness as a group online. Um, so, so that was like a really pleasant surprise. And, and then I started doing um, small retreats online. I, I had a weekend workshop coming up and I um, scheduled it online. I moved it and I changed the focus. And I, within just a few days, I revamped the whole curriculum and centered the retreat on helping people cope with the changes of the pandemic. So I was still using writing as a tool for healing and grounding like always, but I also brought in other teachers um, who mm -hmm. brought in other modalities for dealing with anxiety, uncertainty, and stress. And the other thing I did is I made that retreat on a sliding scale all the way down to free um, mm -hmm. because I didn't want money to be impediment. I really saw it as a service, um, and I ran that retreat a few times. Um, and and then I, I taught another class uh, for the first more than a year of the pandemic, um, called Writing Through the Pandemic. And um, I had people from all over in that class, and we met once a week, and we would write to prompts uh, that focused on whatever was happening in the moment. And again, I, you know, I had a sliding scale down to zero because I, I felt like it was something I could offer at a time yeah. when people needed so much. Um, and I, I think the best compliment I got during that time was uh, an old friend of mine, a former student, and she just said, Laura, you are the most nimble person I've ever met. And I, <laughs> I really took that as a great compliment because I, I, you know, I had to do something and I just, I just found a way to reconfigure um, in a new setting and I found that I could bring the same human qualities into that setting. And that was a big surprise. Yeah, so tell me more about about this pleasant surprise, because clearly you'd had a very unpleasant surprise with the, the whole disruption and, and losing over half your year's income. What was pleasantly surprising? Because it, obviously it can't have been the same. What, what did you discover when you went into that virtual space with a group like this? I think, you know, I think especially at first when it was all new, you know, I think things are a little bit different now. People have, you know, Zoom fatigue and all of that. But yeah. I think in the beginning, people's need to connect was so strong. And mm. in a way, everyone was kind of blown open uh, yeah. by the pandemic. You know, it's like everything was uh, turned on its head and people were so vulnerable um, yeah. and really needing to connect and needing to cope with these huge changes in their lives that they were hungry for what I was offering. And um, so I, I think that was one thing is like, how do you meet the moment with your material? And, you know, the, the, the context of what I do, you know, um, the, the kind of procedures, the, the way I teach has not changed, but the content um, I adapted for the circumstance. And um, uh, one of the, you know, one of the best things, which I think many people have found who are teachers is that, I suddenly could have students from all over, you know. So yeah. it was a benefit to me um, to teach online because I didn't have to just be, you know, putting up posters in my town <laughs> trying to get people to come to my little weekly classes. And that right. made a huge difference for me and for them. Um, so I think yeah. overall there's there are real benefits and there's also things, you know, benefits to being in person. And I think that's true both as the teacher and mm -hmm. also as the recipient or as the student. So 
okay, maybe we could open up that subject of what you'd learned about the pros and cons of of in-person versus online. Um, and I'm particularly keen, you know, I'm, I'm really glad that I've got the opportunity to open this up with you because I've done both myself in my own work as a therapist and a coach. And I was, I, I've been doing online for quite a, a number of years and I've totally understand and respect the position of colleagues that I've spoken to who've said, no, I couldn't do what I do online. It's, there's something so important about that actual sharing the space and the presence that goes with it. So I'm really curious to hear from you and let's face it, the kind of work you do, it it doesn't probably get a lot deeper or, or more intense or more human than what you do. So what have you learned from making that transition from, from in person to online? You know, in some ways, um, you know, what's important in getting people to open or to write from the deepest places or to to build the kind of communities I'm talking about, a lot of it is uh, what I call the container. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it can be a physical container, as I was describing about these different retreat centers. You know, I like to teach in beautiful places because I think I think nature, nature is incredibly important to me. And I think when people are doing deep work, if Mm -hmm. you can go out and walk in by the ocean or walk in the woods or, Mm. you know, just sit and look at the sky, um, it really helps you integrate and digest. So I, I like those kind of settings. Um, But, but building a container also has to do with the guidelines that I establish at the beginning of every workshop. And, you know, it has to do with how I define confidentiality and how I talk about it. Um, Mm -hmm. It has to do with the instructions I'm giving for how to write, um, you know, to just write the first thing that occurs to you and you're not like planning or plotting or figuring out what you're going to say. You just write from really from your solar plexus, from your gut. And that, um, and then the way we listen that in these workshops, um, the ones that are not focused on craft, uh, we don't critique. So you're not, your work is not being evaluated, but it's being witnessed. So it's that feeling of being mm-hmm. deeply listened to. So the way I set the container creates pretty predictable results. And I found that the same results were happening online. And I didn't think that would happen. I thought that, and I also found that I was able to read people, um, that I was able to pay attention to what was going on with people um, mm-hmm. And as I got more facile with the online interface, you know, I found there were a lot of ways to keep communicating with people, you know, whether I was sending them a private chat message, um, whether I was checking in with them before or after the class, if I noticed that they were, you know, not paying attention or their voice was flat, um, mm-hmm. that I was still able to connect in those same ways. Um, you know, one of the things I stress more now, like I'm just now designing um I I teach these work weekends where people just come for three days to write and just get a lot of work done, and I create an environment conducive to that. And I just decided to take it online um, for the first time. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I was last night I was sitting and writing some instructions and that, you know, one of the things I think that's important online is to give people guidance in how do you create self-care for yourself um, outside of the retreat so that, you know, one of the first things I might do at an online retreat is, you know, have people make a list or think about what they could do to take care of themselves if strong feelings arise or, you know, if the writing is challenging Mm. or if they're having a hard time so that before that situation happens, they have a plan, you know, and, and, you know, most people coming to my workshops, they already have a lot of internal resources. Um, So it's just reminding them, you know, what do you do when you're having a hard time? You know, who would you contact? Would you go out in nature? Don't don't put another activity um, right butted up against our workshop so that you have time to integrate what you've experienced. So moving on and, and looking at what you've learned from this experience and maybe what you want to carry forward into your work in the future, what would you say that you've learned maybe that online is really good for and you want to keep doing it for those reasons? And then also, is there anything that you're going to say, well, okay, there, there is a limit, and this is what in person can do that nothing else can, and this is what I'm really looking forward to getting back to? I think for me, the I'm definitely going to keep teaching online. 
Um, and some of it is my own convenience. Um, you know, I don't have to get plane tickets. I don't have to deal with jet lag. I don't have to stay in a hotel. Um, I can just walk from my mm-hmm. house about 20 feet into my office, um, put on a set of headphones and teach, and then go right back and, you know, cook dinner. So I really love the convenience of teaching online. Um, I I like the fact that I have, um, you know, potentially a worldwide audience who can participate in my workshops. So my pool of potential mm-hmm. students has grown exponentially. Those are two things I would not want to give up. Um, so I think I, I will definitely keep teaching. And, and also, mm-hmm. like the weekly classes I have, which are ongoing, um, now many of the members live far away from me. So, you know, you know, most of them live far away from me and a smaller percentage yeah. are local. So I, I would I'd definitely keep doing that. Um, but I, I do look forward to teaching on... Uh, I do look forward to teaching in person again. Um, I think there is... Um, there's something unique and special about being in person um, that you don't get online. Um, and I, you know, I really, I do miss that. I miss, um, I miss just three-dimensionality. You know, um, I, I, I had a, a work weekend with mostly yeah. my local students um, at a beautiful place up in the country um, at the beginning of December before Omicron. Uh, it was a three-day retreat. And I just was so thrilled. You know, everyone had to be vaccinated. They had to send me their vaccine card. They had to get tested before the retreat. We even wore masks indoors because I had a couple of people who were um, at very high risk. Um, and it was just, we all were like, oh my God, we're seeing each other. <laughs> you know, it was it was very wonderful just to be together. And, and many mm. of these were people I'd been meeting with online for a long time. So yeah. um, that was wonderful. Um, but there's also something about the accessibility of online that I feel like I, I feel like I'm not going to turn back from it, um, both for me and for the students. Um, you know, if someone wants to come to a retreat with me um, online, they just pay the tuition. They don't have to buy an airline ticket. They don't have to rent an Airbnb or pay for a retreat center or pay for their meals. Yeah. Um, so there's there's pros and cons, and I think I I will definitely do a hybrid. I I don't think I would do try to do both at the same time, um, you know, like a, an, a retreat that is simulcast. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think that would work for what I do because it's not, you know, it's not primarily yeah. like a lecture or a talk. It's interactive. Um, but I think I will, going forward, mm. definitely have both in my, um, in my toolkit and I'll have both on my schedule. I, I don't see ever going, turning away from um, teaching online. It's been, it's been incredibly valuable and rewarding and you know, surprisingly good. Well, that's lovely to hear, Laura. I mean, one thing I've said right from the beginning of this whole business is that I hope that as some consolation that we all come out of this with more choices than we went in with. Uh, And it sounds like that's the case for you. And that, you know, I'm also hearing that a lot of students are benefiting because they can access your work and your help in who wouldn't have been able to do it beforehand. Yes. Mm -hmm. So. Maybe we can circle back to the the other aspect of your work, the writing, because I know you, but am I right in thinking that you finished writing The Burning Light of Two Stars during 2020 when COVID was very much a part of our lives and that you then had to launch it in the midst of the the pandemic? Yes, (laughs) that's true. Um, I had finished, you know, a draft uh, at the end of 2019. And then at the end of Mm -hmm. 2020, I, I didn't look at it for a year, which was incredibly beneficial because I looked at it with fresh eyes and, you know, I was like a laser beam. I just, I cut 12,000 words in that last pass. Um, I restructured Mm -hmm. the whole book. I shortened the chapters and I think the, the, it has a very propulsive momentum and I created it in that last edit. And I don't think I could have done it if I had, you know, been working on it the whole time, but I was able to look at it with really fresh eyes. Um, So I finished it. Um, really the beginning of the end of 2020, beginning of 2021. Um, and then I wanted to publish it. And I um, I went with a hybrid press and it was a mm-hmm. very compressed timeline. I think I signed the contract in February. The book originally was supposed to come out in October. It got delayed because of paper shortages and was finally released yeah, in ready. November. 
Um, and, it, and, you know, in that time, I also did the audio book. So it was a huge, it was really all I did um, in 2021. I, I, we got a puppy. So I was raising a puppy and the book. Those are my, <laughs> and, and a little bit of teaching. But that, that was my main activity. Um, in some ways, I think because I knew I was launching a book during the pandemic, it was better for me um, than for some authors who were in the midst of launching their book. And, you know, heading out on a book tour when the pandemic happened Mm. because I was able to plan an online launch. I knew that's what I was going to have. Um, So how did you approach it differently? Well, you know, I didn't have any live events. So, you know, no bookstore readings in person, um, no physically signing books for people, no eye contact with a reader, you know, saying how much they love the Mm. book. Um, You know, I didn't I knew I wouldn't have any of that. And um so I did a lot of things. One is that I, um, you know, I have a lot of colleagues who have audiences of their own, and I did a lot of kind of collaborative events um, with other people. Like I have a colleague uh, and friend, Anne Randolph, who also teaches writing and performance. She uh, does a lot of one woman. Wo- she does one woman shows, um, mm-hmm. and she and I got together and, and taught a one day workshop called "The Courage to Complete." You know, it was about how to get your creative project (laughs) over the finish line. And so, you know, she and I did that together. We wrapped uh, a free book into the cost of the retreat. So, you know, all the people who came to that ended up getting shipped a book. Um, And, Mm -hmm. you know, and it was it was definitely a wonderful workshop. And it also really I got to talk a lot about the process of finishing the memoir. So I piggybacked on other people's audiences as much as I could. I, you Mm -hmm. know, developed a stronger social media presence. Um, and my, you know, I had three major launch events. They all were online. Um, yeah, so I, I just, I just had to do it that way. Um, I had to rely on, um, digital mediums. Um, and I, I, I did some of the things I would have done anyway, but, um, it, it was a very different kind of experience. And again, do you think there are elements of this you might take forward? I mean, I don't know how keen you are to write another book soon, but when you get round to it next time, do you think it will affect the way you approach that whole process? Well, I would love to, you know, meet readers in person. I have really missed that um, a lot. Mm. But I think um, a lot of the skills I learned in terms of getting more savvy about online marketing, I absolutely would move that forward you know, for whatever I do next, whether it's teaching or retreats or another book, it's just like my toolkit has, uh, my quiver <laughs> is more full mm-hmm. than it was before. I've just yeah. learned uh, new skills, new ways to reach people, and I will just keep integrating that into whatever I do. So hopefully both will be available in the future. Yes, let us hope fervently that that's the case. So I think this would be a good time, Laura, for you to set our listener your creative challenge. So if you're listening to this show and this is the first time you've heard it, at the end of every interview, I invite my guests to set you, the listener, a creative challenge, which is on the theme of the interview and is something that you can do to stretch yourself creatively and maybe personally as well, and that you can complete or at least get started on within seven days of listening to this conversation. So, Laura, what's your creative challenge? All right, so I'm going to give um, everyone a writing prompt and some very simple directions to complete it. Um, to, To write this prompt, I want you to use writing practice, which is one of the core practices I use in all of my teaching. And mm-hmm. it's a it's a pretty reliable way to get right into the deepest material, to get the editor out of the way, and to write from the core or the gut where the real treasures mm-hmm. are. So the the I'm not going to give you the prompt yet, but here's the instructions. Um, when you sit down to write to this prompt, don't plan or think before you write. I want you just to start with the very first thing that pops into your head the first thing that occurs to you. Um, If you can't do it immediately, you can jot down the prompt and whatever story comes to mind um, and then come back to it later. And we'll also, you'll be able to um, take a look at this in the show notes. But the main thing is don't plan what you're going to say. Don't spend time saying, oh, I 
I think I'll do this. I think I'll do that. You mm-hmm. want to follow that impulse. And then right. once you put your pen on the paper, um, and I do recommend handwriting for this, um, mm-hmm. because you make a different connection physiologically between the brain, the hand, and the heart. Um, and yeah. what I want you to do is write without stopping for 20 minutes. And let the writing go in whatever direction it wants to go. So if you move away from the prompt, that's fine. If you circle back to it, that's fine. Um, Just follow the impulse and write without stopping for 20 minutes. And don't cross out because that is the editor coming in and getting in the way. Just Mm -hmm. write moving forward. Don't reread. Just keep going forward. Um, If you get stuck... Um, you could start back at the beginning with the prompt again, um, or you could mm-hmm. try inserting the phrase, here's the part I never told anyone before. Um, <laughs> or, uh, what I really Help. need to say, <laughs> or what I really need to say is. And that it's like your, right, your conscious right. mind is prompting your subconscious, giving you more permission to get mm. underneath your habitual stories. Um, yeah. So, um, that, so I'm going to give you the prompt, um, and you'll write it for 20 minutes. And in this exercise, just writing it is not enough, um, because we, we often don't know what we've written um, until we speak it out loud. Um, Natalie yeah. Goldberg, who created Writing Practice, says, writing is like the inhalation, and reading out loud is the exhalation. So the second hmm. part of the creative challenge is to read your words out loud. And you can do this with a trusted friend or family member um, or even just out loud to yourself. But you want to speak yeah. the words so you could hear mm-hmm. the impact uh, and really feel it in your body. So here's the prompt. And it starts with a quote from Alexander Graham Bell. When one door closes, another opens But we often look so long and regretfully at the closed door that we fail to see the one that has opened for us. (laughs) Let me read that again. (laughs) When one door closes, another opens. But we often look so long and regretfully at the closed door that we fail to see the one that has opened for us. And the prompt is, tell me about a time this was true in your life. Wonderful. Thank you, Laura. I think that is a really uh, great invitation to all of us to be a bit more courageous in our writing and our speaking and our communicating. So thank you so much, Laura. I've learned a lot from listening to you, from reading the book. I would really encourage people to get hold of a copy of The Burning Light of Two Stars. It's an extraordinary experience to read it. I was saying to Laura, you know, that it's like there are some books you read and there are others you experience. This one is definitely in the latter category. It's a book that you won't forget. I think my experience was it is very moving and parts of it are very painful, but it's also a real page turner. And some of it is, is very funny and very entertaining too. It's, it's a very human book. So Laura, apart from picking up the book, where can people go to find out more about you and your work and and maybe reach out and get some help from you? So um, on my website, which is uh, www.lauradavis.net, you can read the first five chapters of the memoir um, and also order it. And, you know, all the other online offerings um, that I have, it's www.lauradavis.net. Um, I also send out weekly writing prompts similar to the one I just gave you. Um, And if you sign up at my website uh, for my mailing list, you'll start getting those every Tuesday. And they're they're great spurs for either writing or conversation. Great. Thank you, Laura. And as usual, I'll make sure all the links are available in the show notes at 21stCenturyCreative.fm. And also, you know, if you want to have the the reference for the writing prompt, you'll find a full transcript of this interview and, and you'll find the writing prompt at the bottom of the, the transcript. So, Laura, thank you so much for your time and your wisdom. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure.
You have been listening to the 21st Century Creative, hosted by Mark McGuinness. You can find the notes for today's episode with more about my guest, as well as all the backlist episodes at 21stCenturyCreative.fm. If you enjoyed the show, then I hope you will subscribe in Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, and take a few seconds to swipe and leave a rating for the show. If you would like to take the 21st Century Creative Foundation course to help you carve out an original creative career, you can sign up and get the whole course for free at 21stCenturyCreative.fm slash free course. And if you are an experienced creative and you're curious about getting my help as a private coaching client, then the first step is to go to 21stCenturyCreative.fm slash coaching questions and answer the questions on that page. Thank you for listening. I hope you'll join me again soon.